michael a pastoral poem by william wordsworth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana michael a pastoral poem if from the public way you turn your steps up the tumultuous brook of greenhead gill you will suppose that with an upright path your feet must struggle in such bold ascent the pastoral mountains front you face to face but courage for beside that boisterous brook the mountains have all opened out themselves and made a hidden valley of their own no habitation there is seen but such as journey thither find themselves alone with a few sheep with rocks and stones and kites that overhead are sailing in the sky it is in truth an utter solitude nor should i have made mention of this dell but for one object which you might pass by might see and notice not beside the brook there is a straggling heap of unhewn stones and to that place a story appertains which though it be ungarnished with events is not unfit i deem for the fireside or for the summer shade it was the first the earliest of those tales that spake to me of shepherds dwellers in the valleys men whom i already loved not verily for their own sakes but for the fields and hills where was their occupation and abode and hence this tale while i was yet a boy careless of books yet having felt the power of nature by the gentle agency of natural objects led me on to feel for passions that were not my own and think at random and imperfectly indeed on man the heart of man and human life therefore although it be a history homely and rude i will relate the same for the delight of a few natural hearts and with yet fonder feeling for the sake of youthful poets who among these hills will be my second self when i am gone upon the forest side in grasmere vale there dwelt a shepherd michael was his name an old man stout of heart and strong of limb his bodily frame had been from youth to age of an unusual strength his mind was keen intense and frugal apt for all affairs and in his shepherd's calling he was prompt and watchful more than ordinary men hence he had learned the meaning of all winds of blasts of every tone and oftentimes when others heeded not he heard the south make subterraneous music like the noise of bagpipers on distant highland hills the shepherd at such warning of his flock bethought him and he to himself would say the winds are now devising work for me and truly at all times the storm that drives the traveller to a shelter summoned him up to the mountains he had been alone amid the heart of many thousand mists that came to him and left him on the heights so lived he till his eightieth year was past and grossly that man errs who should suppose that the green valleys and the streams and rocks were things indifferent to the shepherd's thoughts fields where with cheerful spirits he had breathed the common air the hills which he so oft had climbed with vigorous steps which had impressed so many incidents upon his mind of hardship skill or courage joy or fear which like a book preserved the memory of the dumb animals whom he had saved had fed or sheltered linking to such acts so grateful in themselves the certainty of honorable gains these fields these hills which were his living being even more than his own blood what could they less had laid strong hold on his affections were to him a pleasurable feeling of blind love the pleasure which there is in life itself he had not passed his days in singleness he had a wife a comely matron old 
though younger than himself full twenty years she was a woman of a stirring life whose heart was in her house two wheels she had of antique form this large for spinning wool that small for flax and if one wheel had rest it was because the other was at work the pair had but one inmate in their house an only child who had been born to them when michael telling o'er his years began to deem that he was old in shepherd's phrase with one foot in the grave this only son with two brave sheepdogs tried in many a storm the one of an inestimable worth made all their household i may truly say that they were as a proverb in the vale for endless industry when day was gone and from their occupations out of doors the son and father were come home even then their labor did not cease unless when all turned to their cleanly supper board and there each with a mess of pottage and skimmed milk sat round their basket piled with oaten cakes and their plain homemade cheese yet when their meal was ended luke for so the son was named and his old father both betook themselves to such convenient work as might employ their hands by the fireside perhaps to card wool for the housewife's spindle or repair some injury done to sickle flail or scythe or other implement of house or field down from the circling by the chimney's edge which in our ancient uncouth country style did with a huge projection over brow large space beneath as duly as the light of day grew dim the housewife hung a lamp an aged utensil which had performed service beyond all others of its kind early at evening did it burn and late surviving comrade of uncounted hours which going by from year to year had found and left the couple neither gay perhaps nor cheerful yet with objects and with hopes living a life of eager industry and now when luke was in his eighteenth year there by the light of this old lamp they sat father and son while late into the night the housewife plied her own peculiar work making the cottage through the silent hours murmur as with the sound of summer flies not with a waste of words but for the sake of pleasure which i know that i shall give to many living now i of this lamp speak thus minutely for there are no few whose memories will bear witness to my tale the light was famous in its neighborhood and was a public symbol of the life the thrifty pair had lived for as it chanced their cottage on a plot of rising ground stood single with large prospect north and south high into easedale up to dunmall rays and westward to the village near the lake and from this constant light so regular and so far seen the house itself by all who dwelt within the limits of the vale both young and old was named the evening star thus living on through such a length of years the shepherd if he loved himself must needs have loved his helpmate but to michael's heart this son of his old age was yet more dear effect which might perhaps have been produced by that instinctive tenderness the same blind spirit which is in the blood of all or that a child more than all other gifts brings hope with it and forward-looking thoughts and stirrings of inquietude when they by tendency of nature needs must fail from such and other causes to the thoughts of the old man his only son was now the dearest object that he knew on earth exceeding was the love he bare to him his heart and his heart's joy for oftentimes old michael while he was a babe in arms had done him female service not alone for dalliance and delight as is the use of fathers but with patient mind enforced to acts of tenderness and he had rocked his cradle with a woman's gentle hand and in a later time ere yet the boy had put on boy's attire did michael love albeit of a stern unbending mind 
to have the young one in his sight when he had work by his own door or when he sat with sheep before him on his shepherd's stool beneath that large old oak which near their door stood and from its enormous breadth of shade chosen for the shearer's covert from the sun thence in our rustic dialect we called the clipping tree a name which yet it bears footnote clipping is the word used in the north of england for shearing there while they too were sitting in the shade with others round them earnest all and blithe would michael exercise his heart with looks of fond correction and reproof bestowed upon the child if he disturbed the sheep by catching at their legs or with his shouts scared them while they lay still beneath the shears and when by heaven's good grace the boy grew up a healthy lad and carried in his cheek two steady roses that were five years old then michael from a winter coppice cut with his own hand a sapling which he hooped with iron making it throughout in all due requisites a perfect shepherd's staff and gave it to the boy wherewith equipped he as a watchman oftentimes was placed at gate or gap to stem or turn the flock and to his office prematurely called there stood the urchin as you will divine something between a hindrance and a help and for this cause not always i believe receiving from his father higher of praise while this good household thus were living on from day to day to michael's ear there came distressful tidings long before the time of which i speak the shepherd had been bound in surety for his brother's son a man of industrious life and ample means but unforeseen misfortunes suddenly had pressed upon him and old michael now was summoned to discharge the forfeiture a grievous penalty but little less than half his substance this unlooked-for claim at the first hearing for a moment took more hope out of his life than he supposed that any old man ever could have lost as soon as he had gathered so much strength that he could look his trouble in the face it seemed that his sole refuge was to sell a portion of his patrimonial fields such was his first resolve he thought again and his heart failed him isabel said he two evenings after he had heard the news i have been toiling more than seventy years and in the open sunshine of god's love have we all lived yet if these fields of ours should pass into a stranger's hand i think that i could not lie quiet in my grave our lot is a hard lot the sun itself has scarcely been more diligent than i and i have lived to be a fool at last to my own family an evil man that was and made an evil choice if he were false to us and if he were not false there are ten thousand to whom loss like this had been no sorrow i forgive him but twere better to be dumb than to talk thus when i began my purpose was to speak of remedies and of a cheerful hope our luke shall leave us isabel the land shall not go from us and it shall be free he shall possess it free as is the wind that passes over it we have thou knowest another kinsman he will be our friend in this distress he is a prosperous man thriving in trade and luke to him shall go and with his kinsman's help and his own thrift he quickly will repair this loss and then may come again to us if here he stay what can be done where every one is poor what can be gained at this the old man paused and isabel sat silent for her mind was busy looking back into past times there's richard bateman thought she to herself he was a parish boy at the church door they made a gathering for him shillings pence and half pennies wherewith the neighbors bought a basket which they filled with peddlers wares and with this basket on his arm the lad went up to london found a master there who out of many chose the trusty boy to go and overlook his merchandise beyond the seas where he grew wondrous rich and left estates and monies to the poor and at his birthplace built a chapel floored with marble which he sent from foreign lands 
these thoughts and many others of like sort passed quickly through the mind of isabel and her face brightened the old man was glad and thus resumed well isabel this scheme these two days has been meat and drink to me far more than we have lost is left us yet we have enough i wish indeed that i were younger but this hope is a good hope make ready luke's best garments of the best buy for him more and let us send him forth to-morrow or the next day or to-night if he could go the boy should go to-night here michael ceased and to the fields went forth with a light heart the housewife for five days was restless morn and night and all day long wrought on with her best fingers to prepare things needful for the journey of her son but isabel was glad when sunday came to stop her in her work for when she lay by michael's side she for the two last nights heard him how he was troubled in his sleep and when they rose at morning she could see that all his hopes were gone that day at noon she said to luke while they two by themselves were sitting at the door thou must not go we have no other child but thee to lose none to remember do not go away for if thou leave thy father he will die the lad made answer with a jocund voice and isabel when she had told her fears recovered heart that evening her best fare did she bring forth and all together sat like happy people round a christmas fire next morning isabel resumed her work and all the ensuing week the house appeared as cheerful as a grove in spring at length the expected letter from their kinsman came with kind assurances that he would do his utmost for the welfare of the boy to which requests were added that forthwith he might be sent to him ten times or more the letter was read over isabel went forth to show it to the neighbors round nor was there at that time on english land a prouder heart than luke's when isabel had to her house returned the old man said he shall depart to-morrow to this word the housewife answered talking much of things which if at such short notice he should go would surely be forgotten but at length she gave consent and michael was at ease near the tumultuous brook of greenhead gill in that deep valley michael had designed to build a sheepfold and before he heard the tidings of his melancholy loss for this same purpose he had gathered up a heap of stones which close to the brookside lay thrown together ready for the work with luke that evening thitherward he walked and soon as they had reached the place he stopped and thus the old man spake to him my son to-morrow thou wilt leave me with full heart i look upon thee for thou art the same that wert a promise to me ere thy birth and all thy life hast been my daily joy i will relate to thee some little part of our two histories twill do thee good when thou art from me even if i should speak of things thou canst not know of after thou first camest into the world as it befalls to new-born infants thou didst sleep away two days and blessings from thy father's tongue then fell upon thee day by day passed on and still i love thee with increasing love never to living ear came sweeter sounds than when i heard thee by our own fireside first uttering without words a natural tune when thou a feeding babe didst in thy joy sing at thy mother's breast month followed month and in the open fields my life was passed and in the mountains else i think that thou hadst been brought up upon thy father's knees but we were playmates luke among these hills as well thou knowest in us the old and young have played together nor with me didst thou lack any pleasure which a boy can know luke had a manly heart but at these words he sobbed aloud the old man grasped his hand and said nay do not take it so i see that these are things of which i need not speak even to the utmost i have been to thee a kind and a good father and herein i but repay a gift which i myself received at others hands 
for though now old beyond the common life of man i still remember them who loved me in my youth both of them sleep together here they lived as all their forefathers had done and when at length their time was come they were not loath to give their bodies to the family mold i wished that thou shouldst live the life they lived but tis a long time to look back my son and see so little gain from sixty years these fields were burthened when they came to me till i was forty years of age not more than half of my inheritance was mine i toiled and toiled god blessed me in my work and till these three weeks passed the land was free it looks as if it never could endure another master heaven forgive me luke if i judge ill for thee but it seems good that thou shouldst go at this the old man paused then pointing to the stones near which they stood thus after a short silence he resumed this was a work for us and now my son it is a work for me but lay one stone here lay it for me luke with thine own hands i for the purpose brought thee to this place nay boy be of good hope we both may live to see a better day at eighty-four i still am strong and stout do thou thy part i will do mine i will begin again with many tasks that were resigned to thee up to the heights and in among the storms will i without thee go again and do all works which i was wont to do alone before i knew thy face heaven bless thee boy thy heart these two weeks has been beating fast with many hopes it should be so yes yes i knew that thou couldst never have a wish to leave me luke thou hast been bound to me only by links of love when thou art gone what will be left to us but i forget my purposes lay now the cornerstone as i requested and hereafter luke when thou art gone away should evil men be thy companions let this sheepfold be thy anchor and thy shield amid all fear and all temptation let it be to thee an emblem of the life thy fathers lived who being innocent did for that cause bestir them to good deeds now fare thee well when thou returnest thou in this place wilt see a work which is not here a covenant twill be between us but whatever fate befall thee i shall love thee to the last and bear thy memory with me to the grave the shepherd ended here and luke stooped down and as his father had requested laid the first stone of the sheepfold at the sight the old man's grief broke from him to his heart he pressed his son he kissed him and wept and to the house together they returned next morning as had been resolved the boy began his journey and when he had reached the public way he put on a bold face and all the neighbors as he passed their doors came forth with wishes and with farewell prayers that followed him till he was out of sight a good report did from their kinsmen come of luke and his well-doing and the boy wrote loving letters full of wondrous news which as the housewife phrased it were throughout the prettiest letters that were ever seen both parents read them with rejoicing hearts so many months passed on and once again the shepherd went about his daily work with confident and cheerful thoughts and now sometimes when he could find a leisure hour he to that valley took his way and there wrought at the sheepfold meantime luke began to slacken in his duty and at length he in the dissolute city gave himself to evil courses ignominy and shame fell upon him so that he was driven at last to seek a hiding place beyond the seas there is a comfort in the strength of love twill make a thing endurable which else would break the heart old michael found it so i have conversed with more than one who well remember the old man and what he was years after he had heard this heavy news his bodily frame had been from youth to age of an unusual strength among the rocks he went and still looked up upon the sun and listened to the wind 
and as before performed all kinds of labor for his sheep and for the land his small inheritance and to that hollow dell from time to time did he repair to build the fold of which his flock had need tis not forgotten yet the pity which was then in every heart for the old man and tis believed by all that many and many a day he thither went and never lifted up a single stone there by the sheepfold sometimes was he seen sitting alone with that his faithful dog then old beside him lying at his feet the length of full seven years from time to time he at the building of the sheepfold wrought and left the work unfinished when he died three years or little more did isabel survive her husband at her death the estate was sold and went into a stranger's hand the cottage which was named the evening star is gone the plowshare has been through the ground on which it stood great changes have been wrought in all the neighborhood yet the oak is left that grew beside their door and the remains of the unfinished sheepfold may be seen beside the boisterous brook of greenhead gill End of Michael, a pastoral poem by William Wordsworth.